Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Susan Sweater. Um, she's a professor in dermatology and uh, director of the Melanoma Center. So she will tell us all about sun and skin cancer this afternoon. Thank you. Here we go. So I'm going to talk about some of the primary prevention strategies we have to reduce excessive sun exposure and therefore skin cancer. Now, when we talk about sunlight, actually only about 6% of ultraviolet radiation that reaches uh, the Earth's surface is ultraviolet light. The vast majority of the solar or sun radiation reaching the Earth's surface is infrared and visible light. And we take a look at the UV or ultraviolet light itself, about 95% is UVA, about 5% is UVB, and none of it reaching the Earth's surface is UVC because it's completely blocked by the ozone layer. So what does ultraviolet light do to the skin? This is a picture of a, kind of a cross-section of the skin in cartoon form, and the top layer is the stratum corneum. That's a renewing population of cells that you think about the rough, dry skin, uh, the stratum corneum. Below that are keratinocytes, which are the main layer of the top layer of the skin. Uh, at the junction between the epidermis, the top layer, and the dermis, below it is the basal layer, and that contains pigment cells called melanocytes. And then in the dermis, we see blood vessels, collagen, elastin, all of the connective tissue, and then below that is subcutaneous fat. Now, what does the sun do to the skin? It cracks the stratum corneum, it fissures it. You're gonna think about a clinical correlate of dry skin, easy fragility. The epidermis gets thinner, again, contributing to fragility. We also see keratinocytes, those skin cells become atypical, and I'll show you some of the sequela of that. The melanocytes change in their configuration. The pigment changes as well, and you'll see uh, sun freckles called solar lentigines as a result. And as the dermis gets thinner over time, and again, this is a normal process of aging where everyone loses subcutaneous fat, but with the sun exposure, you will see significant thinning of the dermis. It will cause loss of the elastin and collagen tissue, which causes sagging of the skin, wrinkling, and then the blood vessels become more prominent. So we see a lot of easy bruising in individuals as they get older, and that is accelerated by the sun. So ultraviolet B is uh, a main wavelength of light, uh, 290 to 320 nanometers, that is responsible for sunburn. It is kind of our sunburn ray, and it also contributes strongly to skin cancer. It does penetrate that top layer, the epidermis, and also the epidermis, upper dermis, not epidermis. And um, it is interesting in that it has both seasonal and daily variations. So we see it being significantly more intense in the summer months. It's more intense in the mid-afternoon hours, 10 to 4 p.m. It also increases with higher altitude. Altitude, So that can be a real issue as we have hikers and skiers uh, in, in the corresponding months of the year who are much more susceptible to UVB at altitude. Uh, it is largely absorbed by the ozone layer and blocked by window glass, but when we think about the EPA estimates of the ozone layer thinning, this harmful radiation will reach the Earth's surface more frequently. Ultraviolet A is a longer wavelength. It will penetrate uh, more deeply than UVB somewhere into the mid-dermis. It is partially blocked by window glass. Um, it is not blocked by the ozone layer. So again, about 95% of the UV radiation reaching the Earth's surface is comprised of ultraviolet A. And unlike UVB, it's strong all day and all year. So we see this, this is not a ray that we have to, we think about it just being intense all year long. Ultraviolet A has become more important and better understood in terms of the damage it causes. And it really is more of a photosensitizing ray. So individuals who have disorders like lupus or on blood pressure or other medications that sometimes make them susceptible to rashes in the sun are going to be ha have this accelerated by UVA. It causes cataracts in the eye, which is a clouding of the lens, um, and it also contributes to skin cancer. And that's really come to light as we've understood the impact of tanning bed use over the last 20 or 30 years, and tanning beds emit largely UVA. So we're going to talk, we've talked about some of the things that UV radiation can do, and I'm going to focus on skin cancer because uh, it is uh, the most medically important and can be fatal. In 2011, uh, we are looking at over 3 million cases of basal cell carcinoma, which makes it the most common cancer in the U.S. and the most common cancer worldwide. There are no specific statistics for this because it's not considered a reportable cancer to registries that then feed into the National Cancer Institute's SEER database. The same is true for squamous cell skin cancer, and there's about a half a million cases. And these numbers were based on a more recent estimate using 2006 Medicare billing 
which was actually more accurate than any numbers that we had before. Now, melanoma occurs in much smaller numbers overall, but it's the most deadly of skin cancers. About one in five Americans will develop skin cancer, and again, the most frequent are going to be these non-melanoma skin cancers, the basal cell and the squamous cell skin cancers, which again, have low rates of death, but can cause significant morbidity, and by that we mean downtime from work, cosmetic impairment, loss of wages, all sorts of things, healing, discomfort, and this is a, an astronomical cost when we look at the, the millions of these cancers that are being diagnosed and treated each year. Um, the melanoma is the most deadly form, and I'll focus on that in a few minutes. Now, we do have a recent significant cause for concern in women regarding skin cancer incidence, and this was based on multiple studies now that have been done looking at both melanoma and those non-melanoma skin cancers in about a 30-year period from the mid-70s to the mid-2000s. And what we're seeing are significant increases in both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers. We're not seeing this in men. And this incidence really has heightened from about 1990 onward. So this suggests a birth cohort effect of women born after 1965. And we have to ask ourselves from an epidemiologic level, what's changed? Well, nothing in the environment's changed between really men and women so much. Women may be outside, their bathing suits may be skimpier, spaghetti straps, et cetera. Um, but there's nothing really from a genetic or host susceptibility standpoint that's changed. And the only thing we can attribute this to is the acceleration of tanning bed use. So tanning beds became prevalent in around 1980 or so, and we're seeing these young women who started to use tanning beds now over this period of time who are now developing more skin cancers. So this is a significant issue. And we do see this now particularly, and I'll talk a little bit more about tanning beds, but um, they really do target vulnerable young women in particular and teens. And, and the restriction for minors to use tanning beds is very sparse nationwide. So who gets skin cancer? We talk about a sun-sensitive phenotype. And we rate uh, the skin based on uh, its exposure to the sun and how much pigment, pigment it has. Pigment is called melanin. So the more melanin your skin has, the darker the skin color is. And we have a, a multitude of skin types, one through six, with one being the very fair skin, type six being very dark, usually African-American skin. This is a, an example of a young woman or young girl with um, type one skin. You think of someone with red hair, green or blue eyes, lots of freckles, almost often a Celtic background. And these individuals are at highest risk for skin cancer. Most Caucasian skin is around phototype two or three, which kind of burns or tans moderately. Interestingly, we are seeing more skin cancers, both melanoma and non-melanomas, in darker skin phenotypes. Um, and we're talking about now more melanoma specifically in the Latino population and African-American population. And so I think this is really uh, highlighting, again, an epidemic of melanoma. Basal cell carcinoma is the most common type of skin cancer. We usually see this in sun-exposed areas. It's very clearly sun-induced. Um, it usually is sort of pearly or pink, kind of shiny. It has blood vessels often coursing through it. So in, when, a, when a man in particular will get basal cell on the face and shaves over it, this is a spot that's going to bleed all the time. And kind of a, a th good hallmark of skin cancer is you know, a non-healing sore. It doesn't go away. It's not a pimple that resolves in a week or two. So that's what you have to think about. Um, it, it does tend to do well in terms of not causing death. But as I said, these larger tumors can cause a lot of cosmetic impairment and morbidity with wound healing and surgery. This is an example. These are kind of, again, shiny papules, again, usually sun-exposed areas. Now, squamous cell carcinoma is important because while well, it's the second most common type of skin cancer, it also causes a fair number of deaths per year. About 2,000 deaths per year are from metastatic squamous cell carcinoma that started with a skin cancer. And this is particularly true in individuals who are chronically immunosuppressed. And you have to think about a person who's had an organ transplant. They're on immunosuppressive drugs, so they don't reject the organ that was transplanted, the kidney, the heart, the liver, the lung. And so we've seen this in the organ transplant population in particular. And we as dermatologists follow these patients very strongly in conjunction with the transplant team because the squamous cell carcinomas could be so dangerous. Now, squamous cell carcinoma has what's called a precursor lesion, actinic keratosis, and I imagine there are a number of individuals in the room who've had these rough, sandy, almost gritty feeling papules, meaning small bumps, treated with cold sprays, with liquid nitrogen cryotherapy. These aren't really precursors to 
uh, squamous cell carcinoma in the sense that each one turns into an SCC. In reality, very, very few of these will actually transform into a cancer, but there's certainly a marker of increased sun damage and a propensity to get skin cancer, and so we do treat them. The squamous cell carcinomas themselves are reddish often. Again, more uh, can have erosions or crusts on them. They still can bleed easily like basal cells. So again, bleeding lesions, non-healing lesions, sun-exposed areas, have it evaluated. Now, for melanoma, this is our most deadly form of skin cancer, although it's, although it's the least common subtype that we see, and about one person in the U.S. dies every hour from metastatic melanoma. Um, and I want to talk about the death rate just a little bit in that about 9,000 individuals are estimated to die this year. We don't have the formal 2011 statistics. 8,700 was the number in 2010. Two-thirds of those individuals will be men compared to women, and this is a major issue that we study at Stanford in terms of why we're not reaching the older male population, and, and men don't navigate the healthcare system as well as women. They don't participate in skin screening. They aren't uh, as tuned into talking to their physician or healthcare provider about what's going on in their skin and other aspects of their health, and so we really are relying increasingly on women and partners, spouses, to really engage in skin self-exam practices, making sure their husband goes to the doctor and gets examined, and we're hoping that that makes a big difference in terms of the death rate that we're seeing in men. We talk about a melanoma uh, epidemic, and this is why. This is a, a graph looking at 50 years of data from 1950 to 2000, and you can see that melanoma has outpaced, it's the top line, has outpaced all other cancers here by 300%. And in part, this is due to us being better at detecting these lesions and patients looking at their skin and going to the doctor. But when we take a look at, at the types of melanomas we're seeing that are increasing, we're also seeing thick cases increasing. And those aren't ones that are really detected by screening so much as thin cases. And so the melanoma epidemic, we believe, is real and, and largely attributable, again, to a lot of change in recreational and occupational sun exposure. Uh, right now, melanoma is the fifth most common cancer in men and the seventh in women. We do see most cases diagnosed at around age 59 or so, uh, but it is the most common cancer in women in their late 20s and is second only to breast cancer in women in their early 30s. There are major risk factors for melanoma. These include a changing mole. Uh, that's actually a warning sign, but older age, male gender, uh, not large numbers of moles or atypical moles, that sun uh, sensitivity, and then family history of melanoma are all important risk factors that should lead one into uh, skin cancer screening or routine exam by their physician. Uh, we talked about the warning signs. A is asymmetry, B, border irregularity, C, color variegation, so multiple colors in a mole, diameter being larger than a pencil eraser, and then E has been added. It means evolving over time, and this is based on a European mnemonic for melanoma detection called the ugly duckling sign. So if a lesion simply doesn't look like the rest, have it evaluated. I think it's very helpful and easy to remember. There are multiple types of melanoma we see. The most common is superficial spreading, which is the slide on the left. This generally has those A, B, C, D, E criteria. So a lesion can be picked up very early if, if again, those are recognized. The lentigo malignant melanoma on the right typically occurs in older individuals. It's often very flat for time, and then we may see a nodule develop. On the right here, you see acrolentiginous melanoma. Here's a subungual variant occurring under the fingernail. So pigmented streaking in the nail uh, or any kind of bleeding of the pigment onto the skin around the nail is very important to have evaluated. And the acrolentiginous type of melanoma is the most common type we see in darker skin individuals who are at lower risk of the more sun-sensitive or sun-related types. So looking at the palms and soles on darker skin individuals, looking at the nails on the fingers and the toes are very important. Now, the nodular melanoma on the left is a difficult subtype for us. And it, it has sort of eluded early detection for dermatologists uh, and physicians all over the world uh, for many, many years. It tends to elevate, grow higher, ulcerate, and bleed. I like to say it has the Band-Aid sign more than the ABCDE sign. So we're trying to find ways so that people can recognize this lesion a little earlier, thinking about elevation, firm lesion, growing rapidly over a month, no matter what the color is. But it can be a tough one to detect early. So how do we prevent skin cancer? It's estimated if we practice skin cancer in fair skin individuals from early childhood on, we could potentially prevent about 75% of skin cancers over a lifetime. And the goal is to reduce, in our primary prevention, excessive ultraviolet exposure, since we know that close to 70% of melanomas worldwide are in some way related to sun exposure. 
Sun exposure uh, reduction programs have been around in the US, Australia, and Europe now for 30 years. They started in the 70s or so. They can be very useful. The problem is we still have to wait several more decades to see if they make a difference in terms of the new cases, the incidence of melanoma, because most cases, again, will occur after age 50. But they're certainly uh, worth uh, partaking in. Vitamin D has created a bit of a problem for uh, skin cancer and, and uh, the whole issue of primary prevention because the tanning salons in particular are promoting that the sun is good for you and we've already heard a little bit about the benefits of vitamin D and there's no question of its effect on bone health, but it also has been proposed to result in perhaps better rates of mortality, in other words, lower death rates in certain cancers, including melanoma. So we, if we look at kind of a latitudinal gradient at individuals who live closer to the equator, a lower latitude, we'll see improved rates of survival. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the question is whether this is related to vitamin D from the sun. You get your vitamin D from diet, you get it from supplements, oral supplements, and you get it from the sun, particularly from UVB, which undergoes a photoconversion uh, in the skin or causes the vitamin D to turn into its active D3 metabolite. The problem is we don't really know the role of vitamin D in cancer protection, including melanoma and its role in survival. And then the amount of vitamin D you need every day based on the sunlight exposure and how that relates to your serum, your blood levels of vitamin D is also questionable, although it's actually been studied now in greater detail. It turns out that fair skin individuals are very efficient at the photoconversion of vitamin D. So after about five to 10 minutes of incident sunlight, that's your incidental sunlight you're gonna get walking to and from the car, um, it, it actually, you will probably max out your skin vitamin D production. Darker skin individuals are much less efficient at that production. They need seven times or more of that additional sunlight to have the same photoconversion. So the public health message from tanning salon operators is completely wrong. You don't need, as a fair skin individual, to get more sun. It's darker skin individuals who need more sun. That being said, we're not recommending the sun as a safe way to obtain adequate vitamin D levels. It's far safer and more predictable to take oral supplements and to try to get increased vitamin D from the diet. And I think most people are aware that the Institute of Medicine's recommendations on oral supplementation went up just a little bit to 600 uh, international units a day for the vast majority of adults. And, and we recommend slightly higher for folks who are aggressive sunscreen users. Tanning, well, what is tanning? Tanning is the way that your skin protects itself against sunburn. Any tan means that the skin is damaged, the DNA is damaged. This will increase uh, the risks of photoaging. It will certainly cause photoaging, that wrinkling and sagging of the skin, and it will contribute to skin cancer. Uh, the tan itself does not prevent skin cancer. It does, again, just help prevent against further sunburn. There is one safe kind of tan. It's artificial, and this is by putting the sunless tanners or bronzers on your skin. They contain a chemical called dihydroxyacetone. This is a stain. It stains that top layer, the stratified or the um, stratum corneum, and it will wash off over time as that layer of skin uh, renews itself in a week or so. The tan isn't protective against sunburn, but that is a safe tan. The bottom line, though, is that when you talk about ultraviolet-induced tan, whether it's from natural sunlight or tanning beds, it is not safe in any way. Now, tanning beds uh, emit mostly ultraviolet A, and both the UVA and UVB that they emit is about 15 times stronger than natural sunlight. So spending a half an hour in a tanning salon, in a tanning bed, uh, without sunscreen, which is what most people would do, would, uh, is about, it's equivalent to about a day of baking on the beach. It's bad news. Mel uh, the tanning bed use has really been shown to increase rates, again, of both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers. And in uh, a large pooled analysis that was done in international data, there was a 75% increased lifetime risk of getting melanoma if you'd ever used a tanning bed less than age 35. In 2010 alone, there were four studies out of the U.S., Australia, Iceland, and um, uh, what was the last one? Scandinavia that showed significant increased risks for melanoma with tanning bed users. And again, the problem is most of these are young women starting in their teen years, and the rates of melanoma, the risk of melanoma, increased in individuals who started at younger ages and used them more frequently. 
So can you prevent sun damage and photo aging? Um, we have a, a lot of sun safe strategies. They're, they're pretty intuitive, um, but it's, I think, really hard to impart this message, particularly in, in young women. Um, avoiding the sun, covering up using sunscreens, certainly avoiding tanning bed use, um, using alternative techniques, and, and tanning accelerators are not yet FDA approved. So this will kind of roll the talk into how effective sunscreens are. Sunscreens absorb or reflect uh, harmful UV rays, and the sunscreens traditionally protect against sunburn. So the SPF, which is called the sun protection factor, is actually a sunburn protection factor. It's for UVB protection only. And essentially, it's the amount of time you can spend in the sun with a sunscreen before your skin turns red, before it sunburns, over the amount of time you spend in the sun without a sunscreen before you burn. So if you add an SPF of 10 into a product, it should give you 10 times longer in the sun. Not that we recommend that you spend 10 times longer in the sun. The higher the SPF, uh, the, the, the more protection you get, although it is questionable uh, if you have a 90, uh, I'm sorry, if you have an SPF of 15, you block about 93% of UV if you have an SPF of 50, you block 98%. The problem is that consumers don't put on enough. And so uh, because consumers are putting on only up to about a quarter to a half of what's needed, um, that we are not getting the same SPF that's advertised in the, uh, the product that you buy. We do also need broad spectrum to protect against UVB and UVA. Now, the chemical sunscreens uh, are those that are called organic. This is confusing. People think inorganic and organic. Organic is safer. Organic here comes from organic chemistry, so that's why they're organic. The inorganic sunscreens or physical sunscreens are made from inert substances. The chemical sunscreens will absorb UV radiation. They contain a number of, of different types of both UVB and UVA absorbers. The physical sunscreens are blocking agents that contain zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. And all of these will allow some ultraviolet light to penetrate the skin. So there's no such thing as a total sun block at this point. Now, in terms of these physical blockers, again, they're inorganic pigments. They're much better accepted cosmetically than they used to be. They've been micronized so that these particles aren't as opaque when you put them on the skin. The problem is by themselves, they do not block into the far UVA spectrum. And so I'm not an advocate of promoting these alone for broad spectrum coverage. They need to either be combined with chemical sunscreens or uh, have the chemical sunscreens used in, in lieu of them. And there will be some better ones on the market that block into the uh, far UVA range but they're not available in the U.S. yet. So what is broad spectrum protection? It's got to protect events both UVA and UVB, and this is now an FDA mandate as of May 2009. So any product now that's out there that says broad spectrum has to have a, an, a photostabilized UVA filter. Our traditional UVA filter was avobenzone. Avobenzone um, is a great drug for blocking, again, to that far UVA spectrum. The problem, though, is that it is photolabile, meaning it breaks down in the sun after about 20 or 30 minutes, which means it's no good. So it has been photostabilized with the addition of other agents, and the one that's available in the U.S. is octocrylene. So when you go to the store and looking for broad spectrum, make sure you use avobenzone with octocrylene. There are other photostabilizers that are available. Um, there is Mexoril, which is an anthelios. There are the Helioplex products. Both of those also contain octocrylene. So octocrylene is the main photostabilizer in the U.S. There are better ones, too, that are going to be developed. Um, well, they've already been developed in other countries, and they're now being looked at by the the FDA and Tinosorb M is, is going to be, I think, a very important sunscreen as it hopefully makes it to the U.S. market soon. But this is kind of a key slide, I would say, is, you know, broad spectrum coverage, you want to go into the far UVA range and so really look for that photostabilized UVA filter. The sunscreens themselves uh, do protect against uh, precancers. They actually prevent them. They can prevent squamous cell skin cancers. And for the very first time, we have data from the last year out of a large Australian study that was a 10-year study showing that regular daily use of sunscreen reduced the risk of melanoma by 50% in the users compared to the control group. But we don't recommend folks rely on sunscreen alone. You want to also practice safe sun in terms of avoiding that midday intense sun and the UVB sun and using protective hats and eyewear. So we do advocate kind of a sun protection package. Sunscreens are an adjunct to shade and protective clothing. Water resistance, I'll just mention, there's no such thing as waterproof. These are now, from the FDA, going to be water resistant or very water resistant, depending on how long the UVB protection lasts, the SPF, uh, after either 40 or 80 minutes of water immersion. 
So in terms of how to use sunscreens, you want to make sure you use enough two to three teaspoons I'm uh, sorry, two to three tablespoons to the entire body and one teaspoon to the face. Generally, the chemical sunscreens, and most it's good to apply them on dry skin 15 to 20 minutes before exposure to allow them to absorb, and they need to be reapplied after swimming or heavy exercise. Common sense in sunscreen use is crucial, and so we've talked about not using these to extend sun exposure um, and uh, really using these as an adjunct to shade. So future directions, and I think this is near my last slide, are really to think about what we can add to sunscreens to make them more effective, and, and either topical or systemic antioxidants to supplement photoprotection and cancer prevention are being looked at. This is sort of the field of nutraceuticals. Antioxidants are already being added to the sunscreen preparations. Vitamin C is very photolabile. It breaks down a topical vitamin C, I should say, in the sun. And so we have to be careful about adding it to products so that it works, but I think this is interesting. Um, we also have a, a number of new UVB and UVA absorbers that have been developed and approved in Europe and Japan. They cover the entire spectrum of ultraviolet light. Uh, in the U.S., one of these was approved, a Camsol, which is the product in Mexerol slash Anthelios. And there are seven that are currently under FDA review, and fortunately, they're in a, a time and extent of application use, a TEA use, which is faster than the typical FDA review, and it's based on their safety and efficacy in studies worldwide. And so hopefully, these will make it to the U.S. market relatively quickly. And these newer agents, uh, the trizols and tri, uh, trizinols, tri, um, are, I think, going to be very effective for sunscreen, but probably not available in the U.S. for several more years. Wash-on soaps and sunscreens, I think, are going to be very helpful, too. This will be particles that are embedded in a soap, easy and more compliant for uh, those who are reluctant to put on any greasy creams. So we are never going to revert to the beach scene of the early 1900s. Um, I think it looks very uncomfortable, but of course it was very good in terms of sun protection. This is a good start. This is from the Desert Museum in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I took this picture in the women's bathroom. I loved it. Generic sunscreen, SPF 30. I had my husband go check in the men's bathroom, and uh, it was there, but probably not being used at all. And uh, this I want to just note, and there's a flyer in the back, and we'll leave some outside. But we conduct a, an annual free skin cancer screening in the Department of Dermatology. Uh, we're happy to take a look at your skin. And if you have any questions or you want to drag a loved one in or a teen or a husband, anyone in, just come take a look. We're happy to. This is on May 21st from 9 to noon. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.